Hi there, Dave Flytus, k Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our video page. And we're at Lions Lake outside of Hungry Horse, Montana. And I'm um, going to have you take a look at it here. Ice is still on it. It's still been a little cold. Today it's going to be about 55, so it'll be pretty nice. But tomorrow it's supposed to be windy. And in fact, it's supposed to be blowing up to 50 miles an hour. So I had to film today, and there's still a little wind. But I got the sock on doing everything we can to mitigate the issues. <clears throat> Before we get right into the uh, stories today, I want to talk to you about a couple things I've, I've spoke about before. Namely, the immigration issue. And I got some nasty comments because I said that because our borders are so porous right now, there's terrorists that are coming across. I said this three weeks ago and I said, we're going to have terrorism issues in the future. And people said, oh, you know, don't, don't instill fear, stop, stay, stay with missing people. I think it's my job to educate you with facts. Just recently, Reuters, and just in the last couple of days, came out with a story that two terrorists from Yemeni, or Yemen, uh, that were on the FBI terrorist watch list came across the border. Uh, one came across January 29th, one came across in March. And <clears throat> there was a 400% increase in people coming across the border from March of 2000 to March 2021. The, that's the difference in those two months. So, those two Yemeni, Yemen, Yemen terrorists, here's their picture. That's just the two they caught. The percentage of captures by Border Patrol in the last three months has gone way, way down. I watched a series of interviews with sheriffs along the border and Border Patrol Association leaders. Uh, for some reason, the administration in these different areas, they won't allow the Border Patrol people to talk, but the association members can talk. And they've said that <clears throat> their apprehension rate has gone way down because they have to take care of the people that they've captured. The, the numbers are just outrageous. So they're not in the field like they should be. And terrorists are smart. Uh, they know that they, their chances of being apprehended are low right now. They're coming across. And that is a scary proposition for the United States. And I worry about us every day because of that. So anyhow, that's that's the terrorism outlook for today, and it's not good. You know, I saw a statement a long time ago about life. And every day I wake up, I tell myself, <clears throat> I'm going to do the best job I can. I'm going to try to excel. I'm going to try to be a, <coughs> a good person. I never wake up and tell myself, I'm just gonna be average today. Average doesn't do it for me. It's never done it for me. And I try to challenge myself along those lines I just explained. And I challenge you, don't ever wake up and just say you're gonna be average. All right? Let's go to the mailbag. It says, uh, my name is blank. I am an avid consumer of your content and very invested in your cause. Upon reading your book, The Devil's in the Detail, I discovered something about an event in my own life that shook me to the core, and I thought I should share it with you. Back in June of 2018, I went to Maui for a wedding trip, and my best friend at that time and her soon-to-be husband <coughs> at one of the many beachfront resorts in Kanapali. We would frequently be at the beach whenever it was day or night. And that was normal for me since I'm Brazilian and, and this is a common practice. But even though the resort was packed with people, the beach was always deserted at night. I remember making a mental note about how weird that was, especially since it was such a sublime sight with one of the most star-filled skies I've ever seen. One night, the three of us were sitting quietly on the beach facing the ocean. I was deep in thought when my eyes drifted to my left and I noticed there were two people down the beach in our direction from about 20 yards away. The more they casually moved towards us, the more I noticed that they actually looked exactly like human shadows and not people. Dark, but also about 40% see-through. 
and one of them had short and white animal horns on his head. As I was taking all this in and trying to understand what I was seeing, the weirdest thing of all happened. I heard a voice in my head basically yell, start praying now. That absolutely startled me, but I immediately obliged, put my head down and started praying. I was in the middle of my first Hail Mary when my, first, when my friend breaks the silence saying she thinks we should go back to the rooms. I raised my head then and the shadows were nowhere to be found. I asked her if she had seen them too and she said yes. She told me she was quietly praying just now, to which I replied that I was doing the same. Her fiancé was, was quiet during this entire time. We packed up our things and left. We went to the beach at, at night many times after this, but thankfully never saw the figures again. What we did see though, when we watched the sky intently, were what looked like stars shining just as much and seeming to be just as far away from Earth, but they weren't stars. They moved fast and with intention, making unpredictable turns at sharp angles. Just as you were about to really get a good look at one, it would disappear out of sight and start fading behind a curtain. The three of us saw these many times, and we would comment on them often and point them out to each other in the sky. Because they seemed to be so far away, we weren't scared, just in awe. The way they moved and the sharpness of the angles reminded me of a lot of a snake game that cell phones used to carry in the early 2000s. Definitely not a plane, a comet, or a shooting star. If I'm looking around a bit, <coughs> there's a trail that goes around this lake. Two years ago, a guy was on this trail, a young man, and he got attacked by a grizzly bear. And he tried to escape, and he got attacked again. So I'm keeping my eyes open. There's one other car parked in this parking lot, but nobody else in the area, and I, I could hear him. For years, I thought that the two figures I saw on the beach must have been regular wandering spirits, that my friend must have been so scared that she somehow was able to communicate telepathically with me to start praying when we did. That conclusion never made me never made too much sense to me, but it was only possible explanation I could think of before I read your book. After looking into night marchers, I almost felt dizzy because I immediately knew what I had seen that night. The part of the book that shocked me the most was that the doorway from the marchers allegedly walk out of in West Maui is right by the Sheraton Hotel, which is very close to where the three of us were, the Westin Villas. I do want to point out, though, that the book, it says that the natives you talk to believe that the marchers only come out in full moons. But I checked the dates, and the day I saw them, and it was actually at least two full weeks before the moon was full, around June 12th. Just thought I'd let you know. I haven't seen or encountered anything paranormal before or since. Thank you for your time, for all you do, and your work has really changed my life. So, what happened was, is several years ago, uh, a friend of mine was in Maui, and knew a native there that was telling her the stories about these night marchers that come out of the mountains they march along the beach and it's not good when you see them so it was an interesting story about people that disappear in the islands etc so when this woman says she saw them that's pretty interesting to me the next story has to do with safety and you need to practice safety no matter where you're at. If you're in the mountains, you're on the water. One thing I tell you always, always to do is to check the weather before you go out. Now, why is that? Well, the first reason is that the weather can change rapidly and you don't want to get caught out in something that you can't get out of. So, Please check the weather before you go anywhere, even if it's a bright, sunny day. And this story captures the reason why. I've postponed this email because you needed space after Ben's passing. Our deepest condolences to you and your loved ones. And <clears throat> I gotta say that this morning was a bad day for me and I had some bad recollections about Ben. And every once in a while I come across something that just reminds me of him or I'll hear a voice that sounds like him or I'll see somebody that reminds me and tears me up. So the video you made about Chance Engelbart, which coincided with Ben's passing, hit me hard and made me think. 
Chance disappeared on July 6, 2019, on the same date that her 19-year-old grandson drowned in a freak storm on Lake Texoma, T-E-X-O-M-A. <clears throat> Eight other people drowned in separate areas of the lake that day. We don't know the locations of the other eight, but Search and Rescue told us as they searched for Coulter. Later, friends told us it was all over the news. Texoma is in the missing 411 usual safe zone, but weird things happened there. It was a bright summer day, and this freak storm came out of nowhere on the... F nowhere. Fourth of July picnic, perfect day. Water, he drowned. Sar recovered his body second or third day. My mind blurs, it's rough. Search and rescue were hindered by the storm for a few hours. Rocky shoreline, sort of a developmental abnormality disability. Sort of a developmental abnormality disability. Separation. The storm initially hit with one giant wind. A small child's floaty got blown 15 to 20 yards out in the lake from the kid's swimming area. Coulter was watching his 11-year-old sister but had a two-person kayak slide on shore. When the wind gust blew the kid's floaty, Coulter jumped on his kayak to retrieve it. Our 11-year-old ran to join Coulter on the kayak. At that point, still sunny, wind was silenced after the first gust. The girl just wanted the, a kayak ride. Kay Coulter said his sister could go if she dons her life jacket. He did not take time to put his on. The floaty was only about 20 yards out. When the kids left shore, suddenly rain blew in hard. My granddaughter told the story from there. They couldn't see shore within seconds. They did get to the lost floaty, a unicorn mythical creature. Coulter reached from the kayak for the unicorn floaty several times. Each time it was just out of his grasp. Finally, he slipped from the kayak to grab it, but the granddaughter says the kayak was immediately blown away. She's a farm strong girl used to doing ranch chores. She could not make headway paddling toward Coulter. She says she could not even see the end of the kayak due to the rain, and the last she saw of her brother, he was struggling to stay above water, but she was being blown away from, by violently driving wind and rain. Coulter had wanted to join the armed forces. As a teen, he studied up on survival. He had a survival backpack already on the kayak. It was totally, out of, it was totally in character for him to be the first to jump to help a kid. It was 180 degrees against his nature not to put on his life jacket. He was not a good swimmer. Our granddaughter grabbed the cell phone from the backpack, called 911 immediately. 911 got the precise coordinates from my granddaughter, was blown completely across Lake Texoma into an off-limits wilderness area. When Coulter's body was located days later, it was just a few yards from the cell phone coordinates on the 911 call. So my granddaughter's ordeal not only involved watching her brother disappear, she was blown into a crazy, wild, thorny, rocky, overgrown wilderness area. When the kayak hit the ground, she got on land in bikini and bare feet. She knew she had gotten 911 and she knew her daddy would find her, but she began to make her way along the shore through briars, stickers, cedars, rocks, in the direction she thought correctly was the park. The look on the granddaughter's feet, legs, and torso reminded me of your description of recovered children being all scratched and bruised. My son-in-law was a manager in the park, the Shepherd Air Force Base Recreation Area. As soon as my granddaughter called 911, they in turn called my son-in-law. He jumped in the boat and began searching for both kids in a driving rain. He couldn't see for, dry, for the driving rain, but he knew he had a good boat, flotation, and fuel. He's a retired 20-year Army vet, so has some skills. 9-11 had told him to call coordinates where the cove where the marina is. He knew where to search and was searching for a couple hours before SAR could self safely put their boats in. He found his granddaughter within two hours. The baby was cut up in, and broken in Granny's heart. Grandpa and I were in South Fort Worth when we got the call from the granddaughter and soon were there. I'm sorry for this length, Dave. I waited some weeks after Ben's death to go into this. I know you are overloaded, but I really see the connections here. Yep, out of normal area, but same date as Chan Singlebart, and nine people drowned in separate incidents in that day in a freak storm. I'm not married to any, th any theories, but there's some significance otherworldly date. Maybe not, but when I saw Chance's video, it crawled all over me. Saved the video and just reviewed it again at 5 a.m. today. It still raises questions to me. Maybe not connected to 911, missing 411. I don't know. God bless you all. That's a brutal day. And 
I hate to hear about any of the, anyone dying, but my gosh, nine people in one day. Can you imagine how horrible that storm must have been? I can't even I can't even begin to ma imagine. Uh, so the first story I'm going to talk to you about today is one that is pretty weird. But it involves a, a young boy named Charles Cherry, 22 months old, missing June 26, 1952, in off a place called Glendale Road in Asheville, North Carolina. And he was with his collie dog in his backyard, playing when he vanished. His father was a physician. It's about 40 miles from Great Smoky Mountain National Park. Uh, the mom went into the backyard, couldn't find the 22-month-old boy, that's a key point, and called the police, called, the, called her husband, and he was wearing just a diaper when he disappeared. Well, the police searched all over, and it was getting into the afternoon. It was 4.30 p.m. when he vanished. It was pretty soon after that that the police started to think that an abduction occurred, and the reason they believed that was because they couldn't find any tracks in the area leaving the area because one of the policemen that responded was a professional tracker. So they brought in a canine, they brought in a bloodhound. Bloodhound couldn't track, police couldn't track. There were no tracks in the backyard up the mountain and there's a big mountain behind their house. So they start going back further and further and they're thinking about the ridiculous nature of going back deep. And about 20 hours after he disappears, about 1.30 the next day, a policeman is far beyond the property, up to a mile away, uphill, and sees Charles in this meadow area, alive with his dog and he was okay. Now, the physician, husband, very smart man. The boy gets down to, back to the house and the dad looks at the bottom of his feet and says, the feet don't match the journey. A mile away through these scrubs, he doesn't have any scratches, nothing wrong with his feet, no scratches on the feet. It doesn't make sense. And the tracker said, well, it doesn't make sense because there's no tracks between the back of the house and where this boy was found. So how did he make the journey? And that was a concern, a big concern on this case. And they talked about it at length and the police kept an open case file on this. <clears throat> the other thing they said was that in that 20 hours that he was missing while they were searching through the night, the parents said, hey, if he's anywhere in this area and you get near him, that dog is gonna bark. Well, when he disappeared, the dog didn't bark and the entire time they were searching that whole area and that area was searched dog never barked so he was missing with the dog canines couldn't pick up a scent he's found in an area previously searched he went uphill they believed an abduction was possible and there were no tracks how did he get there so again as i as i've said dogs can make mistakes dogs and trackers making mistakes doubt it uh, parents saying that the dog's gonna bark if you're anywhere near that boy I believe it so what happened to Charles and how did he get up that hill well he didn't speak so we didn't know and the police never did find out So, this is Asheville, North Carolina, where it happened. Town Mountain Preserve is right there. And the physician's home was on Town Mountain Road right there. A very, even today, it's a very wild area. Uh, going back to uh, 52, I'm sure this was really wild. But uh, the boy had no marks, no scratches, so it wasn't a mountain lion, it wasn't a bear.
quite quite a perplexing story to say the least. Now the next story involves a boy named Alfred Cornell. You gotta trust me on this one, folks. These two stories I'm telling you, in fact, these three stories I'm gonna tell you today, you've never heard them before, you've never seen them before, but you're gonna see them again because people are gonna start putting them on their sites. I'll do the research, everyone else puts them up. But I, I want people to be educated about this. Alfred Cornell, December of 1933, this happened, he's three years old. He lived on a ranch in North Dakota near the Badlands. It was a windy day, very windy day, when he disappeared. His father noticed some tracks leaving, walking out, leading to some sandstone right near his ranch, and then it just disappeared. So Schaefer and Waterford City responded to the parents and the sheriff's call for help. First of all, this is Alfred, cute boy, three years old. And this is the map. This is important now. So there we go. So there's Waterford City. Schaefer's over in this area. This is the Montana border. This is the Canadian border. Kind of get a reflection. Very near the Missouri River key point. So the sheriff gets all of the citizens, almost all of the citizens from these two cities. He says, hey, I want you to stand in a line and we're gonna walk slowly and stay in this line, stay 15 feet apart. And they said that the line stretched for three miles and they started walking. And they walked for 24 hours straight and they weren't finding anything. And the sheriff says, okay, let's take a break. So they take a break, they get back together, and they go for 30 hours straight. And during the time, the article said that they ran across numerous snake pits with poisonous snakes. Uh, there was evidence of mountain lions in the area. The water ponds in the area were poisonous and animals wouldn't drink them, but they were afraid that Alfred would. During the time they're searching, they had an aircraft overhead. Even though there were super high winds, it had to get back on the ground several times. And after 56 hours, after 56 hours, they ended up finding him nine miles away in a straight line. It would have been nine miles from where he disappeared. He was just wearing overalls and he was alive. Now, Les Stroud has always said, nobody walks a straight line, let alone kids. So that means the three-year-old walked probably 15 miles in 56 hours. You believe it? They didn't find the tracks. He was alive, didn't say much. And they said that the feet were bruised, the legs were scratched, but they said he was uh, dehydrated and they thought he was hungry. But other than that, he was in good shape. So let's just say 15 miles, 14 to 15 miles in 56 hours. Sorry, folks, I don't buy that. And I don't think you should either. Now, why do I tell you a case about Charles Cherry and Alfred Cornell, 22 months and three years? It's because the distances don't make sense. Little kids walking that far. I've had two kids. I know that at nighttime, they always sleep. That's their nature. So, say for example, Alfred being gone for two days, guaranteed for eight, 10 hours each night, that kid slept. He didn't get up and walk during the night. And therein lies the issue about the distance traveled. It doesn't make sense. Now, the next case, involves two locations and I'll, I'll show you about this first because this is important this is involves this case in two cases in south africa one in durban and one in cape town cape town durban actually i've been to cape town I'll tell you that story 
I was working for a, a technology company and I was a business development officer for it and it had to do with technology in the diamond industry. It was really good technology. And I went to a uh, worldwide conference in Cape Town and it was for uh, all the natural resource officers in South Africa. And we were pushing a technology so I went, they sent me there to meet with these people and uh, I had the former senior VP for De Beers that was working with us doing the introductions. First day of the conference, we're at this super nice hotel where this conference is at, and one of the uh, intelligence officers for the uh, Cape Town Police tells us all, you do not leave this hotel without an armed security escort, ever. I'm thinking, whoa. Thinking it's a pretty nice place. And he goes, I know all of you want to go down to the waterfront. And they have this really nice waterfront area about three or four miles away. He goes, you go with us in a van. We'll give you a police escort in front and behind. And you stay there. When you want to come back, you come back with us. And then uh, because of my law enforcement background, I went over and I talked to the guy later. And I said, wow, is it really that bad? And he goes, it's really that bad. We have uh, armed carjackings and robberies too many to count daily and this was uh, back maybe a decade ago uh, maybe about 15 years ago now but uh, Cape Town is a beautiful city with horrendous crime problems back then at least and but the people there were so nice if you're from Cape Town or you're from South Africa I love your country so this story is a little different than some I've talked to you about in the past First of all, the last name of this person is G-Q-O-N-T-S-A, like Kantsi. And the first name is Tatiki. Happened uh, August 6, 2017, about 5.15 in the morning. He was 61 years old. He had, uh, he had surgery at a place called Stellenbosch Hospital in Bolin, South Africa. And that's about 20 miles east of Cape Town. He was completely incapacitated after the surgery and for the hours afterwards. And that morning, he disappeared in the hospital. Sounds weird, but the nurses said he was there one second, he was gone another second. So that was the 17th. They searched, they brought in the police, they did everything. Well, part of the hospital had some construction going on and the construction guys were tearing out a wing of a hospital and they they tore down the ceiling and they found the man in the ceiling dead no cause of death the family was notified and they were irate they told the south african government you need to investigate there's no way my dad got up there there's no way he was even awake come on what happened and you know, you can read about, there's, there's articles out there about this case, but they never did find an answer about how he got up there. Now, when I heard about this case, I thought, I don't remember hearing anything about this, even close to this in the United States. But go to May 10th, 2019 in Durban, and a man named Sandil Sabaya, he was a builder, construction guy, and he broke his leg. And he was taken to a hospital on May 9th, 2019. He went to the Mahatma Gandhi Hospital in Durban. And he had a broken femur. That's between your hip and your knee. It's a big bone in your leg. Well, they determined that he was gonna have to go to uh, Addington Hospital to have orthopedics, a specialist look at him because it was, it was a bad break. This man was 53 years old. Tatiki was 61 years old. So anyhow, He's in the hospital getting ready to be transferred at 5 o'clock in the morning. Nurses said he's right there. His leg's broken. He can't go anywhere. He disappears. Now, they bring in the police. Giant search of the hospital. They don't find anything. So that happened on May 10th, the second day he was at the hospital. Fast forward to May 24th. There was... There was a closet in one part of the hospital where people said there was this bad odor for coming from for a week and they couldn't determine where it was coming from. Well, on the 24th, things started to drop from the driplets of stuff from the ceiling. And what they did was they took the ceiling panels out 
and Sandil was deceased in the ceiling panels. Again, no cause of death. 700 miles separate Durban and Cape Town. But one thing that's important is that they're both waterfront cities. Very, I mean, they're on the ocean. And to me, it goes back to that water. Now, I have no idea because they never would release the cause of death of both of these men. Uh, in the first case, Tatiki, I don't remember them ever even saying that they knew the cause of death. But Sandil, there was an implication that they told the family, but they didn't say why. So, folks, there's four cases. Puzzling, to say the least. I want, I want each of you to please, if you appreciate these videos, give me a thumbs up. And please put these on your social media sites. Uh, little boys do not walk 10 miles through the wilderness. Sorry. And Charles Cherry uh, obviously did not walk from the back of his home to the top of his mountain. There's no way he did that. So I appreciate you listening and watching. And I'm humbled that I have people who care. As we're stepping into spring and there's more of you that are going into the wilderness, I think it's really important that we continue to talk this safety. The best thing you can do for anybody going into the wilderness, if it's coming up on their birthday, get them a personal locator beacon. Just go to Amazon, read the reviews on the ones they offer. They're all about the same. Uh, biggest difference between some is some are waterproof, some aren't. But a uh, personal locator beacon is something you should be able to think about getting. Most of the personal locator beacons do not have a monthly subscription. You don't need to buy, it, buy a monthly subscription to get one. Some that don't have a monthly subscription do other things like you can text back and forth with each other, etc. But anyhow, think about getting one for your friends and family. You, it could be a shared item. Anyhow, I'm humbled that you care enough to watch. Thank you very much. Give you a little scan of the lake here. Oh, there's Mr. Woodpecker. Ice is still on the lake. Kind of hear everything here. You can hear woodpeckers. There you go. <laughs> All right. You guys have a great week. We'll be in touch. Thank you. Bye.